Welcome today, everyone, for this episode of uh, Manufacturing Talk Radio. And uh, as every beginning of the month, the Institute of Supply Management comes out with their uh, manufacturing report. And then in two days, they come out with their service uh, sector report. And then two or three days after that, they come out with their uh, report on uh, hospital uh, uh, sector. And we have all three on our show. So they're interesting. There's a lot of numbers, but it gives you great insight into what's coming or maybe not coming. So today we have uh, Tony, uh, Tony Fiore, who's the committee chair. Uh, Tim, sorry, Tim Fiore, uh, the committee chair for the ISM manufacturing report. Thanks for being with us. Welcome. Good to see you, Lou. Good. So I see you're all cheery and red. What are you? A I got my engineer shirt on. Oh, I thought maybe you were a leftover from Valentine's Day. <laughs> I got my engineer shirt on, and I'm down in South Florida, so I got a little bit more color. Got it. But got uh, it. hey, what a great month! A fantastic month, middle of the first quarter. Uh, we had a little bit, I had a little bit of concern in January about demand. We saw a little bit of softening in the expansion on demand side and our backlog dropped down to a much more normal level compared to where it's been for the last year. Those things all reversed in February. We had an over 60 new order level. I think it was close to 62. Yeah. The, the new export order supported that. It, it came up almost four points to 57 and some change. The, uh, the shelves of the customers are still empty. It relaxed again down close to 31. And on top of that, the backlog had its largest expansion in 11 years, hopping back up to 65, about an eight and a half point expansion. So, you know, like I've said from the beginning, as long as demand is there, things are great. Everything else we just have to work through and demand is clearly there. I think what happened in February, what happened in, in January, as we discussed, is that there was probably a pausing that occurred uh, as buyers looked at extensive, uh, at, at really unusually long lead times as well as high prices and decided, okay, wait a minute, let's, uh, let's just take a pause here. They probably had orders placed out through a reasonable period of time and uh, they didn't see the need to go ahead and place more. But I think that as they closed January and uh, came into February, uh, lead times got extended yet again, capital uh, lead times and uh, raw material lead times are at their longest level in modern history. And prices, uh, Prices actually sagged slightly, but not much. So I think it said, okay, let's go ahead and place those orders. You know, I, I know just in my own uh, uh, business, we, you know, we've, we've, the, the order book for 2022 is full. So, and they affect a whole bunch of other companies and industry sectors too. So I, I think that's kind of what's happening with everybody is that 2022 is pretty much full and we're all counting on additional capacity, assuming that the supply chain will continue to ease a little bit. And will open up some more opportunity to grow, grow the top line and, and margins. But you know, in the meantime, this supply uh, constraint, the governor, the throttle, whatever you want to call it, is extending out the typical expansion cycle in manufacturing, which is generally 34 to 36 months. You know, we're coming up already on 21, 22, still running at a 58. That, uh, that average period of 34 to 36 months is a 50 to 50. And we're still running across the top at a really nice level. So, uh, so yeah, so February feels really good and, and March feels even better. Uh, one of the things that have me concerned taking the, the negative side of this, one of the things that has me concerned is that uh, uh, how, one, how long can this uh, demand driven economy uh, move forward? Uh, we're talking about a 36 month cycle. Uh, but we have so many uh, potential headwinds, and it's not the same reasons why the economy is strong now as it was in strong periods other times, uh, if you catch my drift on that. Uh, it's a demand-driven inflation that we have. Um, we, we have headwinds like uh, what's going on in Europe. Uh, right now, which could definitely have an impact somewhere down the road on the American uh, economy, um, especially in the bars where they're all throwing out Russian vodka. Uh, so they are, uh, 
doing their little part in teaching uh, Mr. Uh, Putin a lesson. Uh, that said, do you see this as a uh, potential headwind? You know, I don't remember the last time I bought Russian vodka. It's nothing that's really available here. The only one I can think of is Russian Standard, and it's pretty cheap stuff. Great. So most of the vodka we get is Finnish, Swedish, French, or Polish. So I'm not worried about vodka uh, slowing up or the famous one, Tito's out of Texas. That's the best. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> so, you know, this is an odd expansion. Remember, we started to contract. We went into contraction in the manufacturing sector in the summer of 19. We, we went in well before the pandemic. So we were already in a decline. We had had a 36, 38 month expansion. Sorry about that. I had some distractions here in my in my studio. No problem. <laughs> so, you know, we started to contract in the summer of 2019, you know, well before the pandemic hit and drove us off a cliff in March of 2020. So this is not this is I don't wouldn't call this a normal expansion. It's got a little bit more uh, juice to it, primarily because um, Americans spent about a year at home saving money and spending stuff in different ways. And you know, like I've said, even when the service sector comes back and it sure looks like it's going to come back soon for this summer, and I'm hoping that we don't have the next cycle of a variant, nobody's talking about one. And I think the last couple of months we have been talking about if there is another one and so far nobody's talking about one. Uh, you know, we, we generally, we've seen those come about in the summertime here because people are inside in the air conditioning in, in the South anyway, and then they come back and in the holiday period, but hopefully we won't get another variant. But, you know, people have got still have a lot of pent up demand in the manufacturing sector. A lot of it is pent up demand. And I think this has gone on so long that there's going to be at least a six month overlap between the service sector pretty much opening up and people still satisfying that pent up demand needs. I mean, you know, a lot of people have wanted cars, haven't been able to get one in a year uh, just because right. they can go out to dinner or go to a movie doesn't mean they're not going to buy that car. And then and you have the cars wearing out now too. It's been a year, year and a half without an adequate supply of certain things. I, I was uh, shopping for uh, refrigerator the other day, and it's still, you know, a fourteen week lead time on something that should be more like four, and it's not. It hasn't gone away yet. So, I think we're sitting here at a forty five month expansion. Usually, what's a 30, 34, 36. 36, Yeah, yeah, we got forty five months, and we're only twenty one months in. So we're not even halfway there. I think well, this is going to run all the way through into 2024. If I plan my retirement, great, I'll miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you miss a decline. Yeah, me, I'm definitely going to miss that decline. Not in this role, but in my other role. Okay, so, uh, hey, you want to see the charts? Uh, well, let's, uh, some of these uh, responders, let's uh, see what they're saying. Oh, okay. All right. So, so let me start it off by saying, um, you know, the sentiment was 12 to 1. The, the, the sentiment around future demand. Yeah, 12 to 1. The month of January was 7 to 1. So we actually got even more optimistic about the future in February compared to the last time I had seen a number that high was actually July at 13 to 1. So we're feeling really good. Uh, you know, labor continues to be a problem. And, you know, quits continue to be a problem. Early retirements continue to be a problem. And one of the things I've been watching now for about six months is is the hiring situation improving in spite of the fact that the unemployment rate is really low? And you know, we still have that percent of the workforce participation, still about one point below where it was pre-pandemic, which people are having a hard time explaining. But so, uh, you know, in the month of January, 11% of my employment comments said that it was getting easier to hire compared to December. Uh, in the month of February, uh, we're down to 4%. So I think that is carryover from Omicron. That you know, people just weren't responding to the to the to the ad, the put-ons, the ads. Uh, people weren't as likely to quit when there was all that uncertainty and, and possibly lose their health benefits for a month. So uh, so it, it was a little bit harder, I think, to hire in February than it was in January. And you see that in our employment number. Our employment number eased a little bit, still expanded, but not to the same level. And we've been fighting really hard to get half-point gains every month. And we actually saw a step back here of 1.6 months. So we have so, so we almost lost probably two months worth of gains 
in the month of February, which is Omicron related. But I think that's all behind us. I think in the, in the month right. of March and in April, we're going to see that employment number go, you know, step up again, half a point to uh, hopefully a point. So, um, but the, you know, the general, because the general comments section, which is the headline comments around labor, was in January, 31% of the comments were labor related. This is Omicron. And, and when they're commenting, they're commenting about their own companies as well as their supply community. In the month of February, that number dropped down to 12%. So there seems to be an easing on the labor side, which is really positive. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that really hurt the, um, the labor side in February was transportation. So, you know, I've been tracking, tracking transportation because it's an early indicator of the manufacturing economy, which is an early indicator of the entire U.S. economy and to a large extent the world's. So we were all worried about ocean freight. And, you know, month of February was Lunar New Year. You know, we had the last sailings occurred probably around the last week of January, maybe first week of February. There's probably about a three, three week hole in February where there's no sailings out of, far, of the Far East. And it, get, it gave the docks, uh, the West Coast docks and East Coast docks, a chance to catch up on some of the backlog. Now, I don't have the exact numbers of ships, but I think they've done some catching up. New ships are probably now going to start arriving within the next five to seven days. But on the ocean freight side, uh, we had a peak back in October of 27% of my, trans of my uh, supply delivery comments were transportation related. That's a huge ocean freight related, huge number. We're down now to 11%. So... I think the OSHA freight thing is probably eased a little bit. We'll see because now we're get, we got to get ready now for the potential labor strife there on the West Coast and what you know, slowdowns, maybe slow down, you know, walkouts, all that stuff. They they play a hardball game out there. Yeah, we still have the issue about not enough containers uh, and also not enough drivers. Drivers, containers, chassis, yeah, everything's yeah, all so messed we, up. We still have that whole problem, and it's now moved up to Canada uh, on the West Coast, Vancouver, where uh, shipping into Canada, you know, it was easy. Uh, well, now the, their ports, which are considerably smaller, Vancouver, uh, they're jammed. And there's about a two to three week wait to get your container off the dock. So that's not, that's not helping their economy especially with what happened at the border uh, on the East Coast, that didn't help their economy. So they, they've, got, they've got some problems up there. Yeah. And it also affects us because they're our largest trading partner. Right. So there was a lot of diversions from the main ports to try to avoid the main port backlog. But what people don't quite realize is that the transportation networks out of those secondary ports are not strong and sophisticated. They're just not they don't right. have the drivers, they don't have the equipment, they don't have the chassis to move stuff. And it takes a while. They don't have the warehouse space to decant the containers, empty them and send them back. It's The infrastructure is just not there. So, it's you know, correct. yeah, there, there was a lot of that that happened, I think, tail end of last year. But as far as general transportation, which is primarily road freight, uh, in the general comments section, I mean, we, we, uh, we peaked in October at 40% of the general comments were transportation related. We're, we're now down to 25 but up five points from January. So road freight was an issue in February for sure. Right, right. Uh, and then the supplier delivery section, which you know, you're know you really gonna hone in on transportation. We peaked in November at 55% of the comments. Uh, we're now at 40. So road freight was still an issue in February. It's still going to be an issue in March, but I expect it to not be as much of an issue. And you know, we'll see what happens here in the ports uh, come April, May. As long as that backlog is there to work off of uh, the actual numbers, shipping numbers and so on, should be secure for uh, 30, 60 days uh, until perhaps some of these other issues start resolving. But uh, yep. that said, let's, uh, let's get to some of your charts. Okay, sure, let me put them up here, let's see. All right, you seeing this? Uh, yeah, we're seeing it. Right, hold on, let me blow it up. Okay, let me see if I can get my pointer going. Yeah, all right, we got it. Okay, for, for your listeners and watchers, uh, this is the manufacturing at a glance chart. This is kind of the money chart. And you can see that what I do is I group the 10 uh, indexes, sub-indexes, into three categories, demand, consumption, output, 
and inputs. So like I said, uh, and some of these go into the PMI number, some don't. New orders goes in, production goes in, employment goes in, supplier deliveries goes in, and inventories go in. The other five are supporting indexes of, uh, of the first five. So you know, demand, new orders, look at this, up 3.8 points. New export orders up 3.4 points. Backlog up 8.6, as I mentioned. The strongest <laughs> gain in a month in 11 years. That's huge. Yeah, isn't this something? This is just so reassuring, you know? And especially when January was a questionable month because we had an easing in, in new orders, new exports were flat, customer inventories came up a little bit, backlog eased off. So there was, it looked like something was at play. I figured it was just really just a pausing and it sure appears that way at this point. So, you know, really strong. Then let's look at the input side, which since this is demand uh, input constrained, supplier deliveries only up 1.5 points. That's not bad at all considering we're coming off a difficult period here with transportation and Omicron hitting labor at the supplier levels. I, I think in the month of February, the panelist companies made more progress on labor than their suppliers did. Mm. So you, you can read through the comms, you can kind of see it. But in any event, I think our, our panelists uh, did better than the suppliers did. So it means that they're going to actually follow us. And I'm not all that surprised at that. Inventories came up slightly, half a point. That's good. That probably reflects more uh, work in process inventory as they continue to build out uh, semi-finished product because they're missing pieces. And, uh, and that's, you know, as we're halfway through the performance quarter, working capital is not as critical in, in uh, January and February as it is in March. And I think we kind of put some money into inventory here to absorb our cost, fixed cost base better and be prepared to, uh, to easily turn that into revenue quickly when the key parts show up. Prices, again, uh, you know, pretty, stay pretty stable. Uh, I was a little concerned that we'd see that jump up as well as supplier deliveries. It's funny how supplier delivery and prices are staying pretty much in lockstep with each other. As the supplier delivery number gets worse, i.e. better, the price number goes up and, and, and the reverse is true too. Now on the import side, we're pretty flat. So uh, you know, it, it, I, I think we're gonna see this number probably change a little bit in March as a result of uh, you know, that lull that we had uh, at, the, at the dock. So, so inputs, I, you know, I think they could have been a lot worse. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of pleased that they weren't because then you just have longer to recover. Uh, so overall, I mean, th these two went into the PMI index that actually contributed about two points of the PMI number. So then the story here is, okay, what happens on the conversion cycle? You know, production up at uh, seven tenths, you know, really weak. We, we need to be at 62, 65. We need to be there to, to meet the new order level and burn off some of this backlog. And the reason we're not there is because we can't get the deliveries and the employment numbers are still sluggish. So we dropped off 1.6 points on uh, employment expansion. I think that's, uh, you know, just a bit of a bump, speed bump in the road. And you know, we'll see this number probably get back in the 54, 55 level in March. So uh, all pretty good. Over here on the right-hand side, you know, 12, like I said, 12 to one positive to cost of sentiment up from seven to one in January. Uh, you know, not as much optimism on the hiring side from the standpoint of it improved or not, not so much optimism, but in reality, looks like they actually struggled more in February than it did in January, bringing people on. And then 38% uh, of the comments noted high levels of turnover down from 44% in January. So that seems to be easing a little bit. And we, you know, we beat the consensus estimate here by about six tenths, which is always a good thing. So I think I've got, uh, I got my chart over here, this, the speedometer. Now you can see here that, let me see if I, yeah, we're still running. I mean, I think last, last month I put up the color between 60 and the peaks. And you can clearly see that on this right-hand side, We've uh, spent more time over 60 than any other time in the last 20 years. And we didn't break the 60 line, so that, that rationale continues. Uh, and, and I don't know that we'll ever break the 60 line again. If we do, it might be from a hurricane, which will drive supplier delivery numbers up, which I really don't want to see. So hanging around 58 uh, is great for me. That's To me, that's strong performance. You can see, just you know, draw a line across the top. In the last 20 years, there aren't that many times that we were above 58. Yeah, that's so, true. Staying that's above true. 58 is pretty good. Nothing to, nothing to be ashamed of, for sure. Um, the oil prices, uh, generally speaking, dictate uh, a lot of uh, production, uh, i.e. 
the more they pump, in spite of the, the, the cost of the gas, they're still pumping like crazy because they don't want shortages. Uh, so they, in my world, that's when they start replacing worn out parts. Yep. And they, yep. and we've gotten this past month, our old uh, oil and gas people uh, ordering, and then they call back a couple of days later and say, no, you better double that order. And then the third time, no, nah, you know what? Triple it, we're gonna roll it out. So there, there are people that are being very confident uh, that this uh, the oil pricing is going to stay high. Uh, you know, high is at 60, it's over 100. Um, and I think the highest it's ever been was 120. It's all like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. But that's great for the oil business and uh, it's good for steel replacement parts. Yeah, yeah. So, right, the oil industry is a big consumer of steel products, for sure. Uh, you can see that in our fabricated metal products there, that they're, they really look to the oil industry to, to, to help, uh, you know, their revenue line. I, I think, you know, steel plant capacity is running about 81%. That's primarily because a lot more steel has been brought online. Uh, mill capacity, uh, you know, that we've now uh, got a quota system in place or, or a, a ceiling system in place with Japan. So, in Japan, generally, will import high quality steel into the US. Uh, it's, it's, you know, really, it's good stuff. It's not, you know, run of the mill stuff. I think the Ukrainian Russian situation, its biggest near term impact is on the energy markets. And I have a little bit of concern over 100 bucks that that clearly represents reinvestment capital. It's very easy now for the oil companies to get in there and invest, as you mentioned, and produce a profit. Uh, I think that break even line is probably uh, somewhere around 65 to 70. Right. But there's also been a lot of headwinds here, uh, disfavor in uh, anybody investing in the oil industry because we're trying to go green. I, I think this this may be a positive backlash from Russia, Ukraine, where you know maybe we'll kind of back off a little bit and really think of the near term and the moderate term future here and mm -hmm. allow the U.S. oil drillers to get back to do what they do best. Uh, I, I think the uh, increasing price of energy is the single biggest risk to slowing down the manufacturing economy as it always has been. And you get to a certain level and next thing you know, things kind of run out of gas quickly. So uh, we, you know, what we need get, you know, literally. So what we need is we need that 13 and a half million barrels a day of, uh, of uh, drilling. And so we can get back up there and, uh, and, and help the Europeans with natural gas, you know, cause that's actually uh, oil equivalents. You know, ship more LNG to Europe because they're going to need it. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, we're, we're essentially sanctioning a whole bunch of Russian companies, uh, but we're allowing some of them to still trade. But if, if they can't exchange money, I don't know how that works. I mean, I, you're not going to be running across the border with bags of dollars, you know, in the billion dollar range. I don't know. There's a lot of things about this that we don't fully understand, which is the, the I think the biggest risk. But you know, the, the, the near term thing for me is the oil markets. And, and I, I don't like seeing $110, $115 a barrel oil. I, I would much rather see 65 to 70. Well, that's a good, it's good, 65, 70, 80. That's still a good number for uh, manufacturing. Uh, 100, uh, I've never seen 100. So uh, I, I, we just saw a clue of it this month. And if the jump in our sales is a result of uh, the pending uh, continuing increase in oil, you know, bring it on. Uh, not that I'm in favor of what's going on, obviously, in Europe and Ukraine, right. uh, but it certainly does seem as though that there's been a whole lot of bad planning uh, in regards to all of this. And uh, that's... Uh, it's going to take a while to figure out a plan to get out of it. You mean the uh, you mean the Russian Ukrainian situation or uh, uh, yeah. our access to energy? Uh, well, you know, you name it. You need a plan. Yeah, you definitely need a plan. And well, yeah, you know, but the the public doesn't it really frowns on an energy plan because the energy plan tends to be accommodative to the to the producers and. Right. Hey, if that's what you need, that's what you need. But the public, or at least the public is told that it's not really a good thing. And, and I'll tell you, EVs, I was glad to see the Super Bowl advertisements, all the cars 
with EVs. Yeah, yeah. And there was uh, uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden. He has requested that the oil companies not increase their prices and price gouge. Uh, it's sort of a weak, uh, willy-nilly attempt to make that happen. But who knows, it might or it might get more serious where he puts a freeze on oil prices here in this country. I'm not sure what price gouging is. If, if we just took the handcuffs off them and let them drill and refine and deliver, then you'll see the prices come back into the right level. Well, sure, you know, market market driven pricing, but uh, first you go through the gouging. <laughs> uh, I think you are on mute. I am. I'm not a big fan of that term. <laughs> I'm not sure what gouging is. I mean, it's it's supply demand and prices are what they are to 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 meet the supplier and the buyer's needs. I mean, that's the only way you fix it is need more. Right. That's right. true. That's true. Well, that's uh, it's a great report. Uh, it's sounding like, and I know you don't like to predict or forecast, but lately you've been loosening up on that a little bit. Uh, it sounds like uh, March is going to be. Uh, uh, unless the world comes to an end, March is going to be as good or better. Yeah, I don't see why not. I, you know, absolutely. I'm, you know, I'm, like I said, I think supplier deliveries is going to relax a little bit. So we got to make it up somewhere. Hopefully we'll make it up on the employment side, get to close to 55 again. Right. And, then, uh, you know, I'm surprised the new orders is 62. I mean, but I think it's going to stay strong until probably April, May. Yeah. Uh, so that, hey, that's good, and I, and I think production is the big opportunity here to, to get to sixty three, sixty five. So we're, we're going to hang in the high fifties here for quite some time, I think. Well, your 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 lips to all of our ears, uh, and uh, thanks for being on the show again. Uh, we'll see you uh, next month, and uh, just want to remind everybody to tune in to Manufacturing Talk Radio uh, every week. Uh, we have uh, women and manufacturing every week. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I, what's the third one? Oh, Hazard Girls, uh, which is kind of an interesting show about uh, a woman who entertains and hosts women who come from unusual workplaces, uh, work environments. It's uh, kind of novel, uh, but she also makes shoes that are very luxurious but they're work shoes so she's got a real niche there so tune in to that um and uh, uh tim again i appreciate your joining us and uh we'll be talking to you again all right thanks everybody look forward to seeing you in uh, early april you bet thank thanks. you bye bye So that's it, folks. You heard it here. Uh, things are going great. Uh, things are going great with uh, our, our Forge company, All Metals and Forge Group. Uh, we wish uh, Tim a speedy re recovery. And uh, I, I would presume he's watching. So I'm going to just give a quick wave, Timmy, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.